Hello and welcome to the online Master of Public Health Programs Hot Topics in Public Health webinar presented by the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. My name is Phil Saloria. I am a graduate admissions advisor for the Master of Public Health Program and I will be your host for today's webinar. I would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. To begin, I'd like to review what you can expect during this presentation. To cut down on background noise, everyone is on listen-only mode, and if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please be sure to refresh your browser, and if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please type them in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and hit send. Feel free to enter any questions as you think of them, and we'll be sure to answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. Also, a copy of the presentation and recording will be available soon. I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Shuba Kumar, PhD, MPH, to touch on our experience and work within the program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to interact with you. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a short little bio about myself and about some more information about the program, and then we'll, we'll hand it off to our students and our faculty. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the program director for the online MPH program and an associate professor in the department. Um, I specialize in global health and completed my MPH uh, quite a while back and really loved uh, particularly program evaluation and understanding what are the impacts of health programs. And that's where I really chose to focus my research as well as my teaching. Um, I pre prior to academia also worked primarily in the NGO sector and, and helped start up an NGO, um, doing humanitarian work around the world, and worked with various NGOs, uh, and I still do today in more of a research capacity. So that's a little bit about me. Um, now to share a little bit more about, uh, about our program. So our online MPH program is housed within the Keck School of Medicine. And the Keck School of Medicine was uh, established in 1885. We're actually the oldest medical school in Southern California. And we are affiliated with several hospitals and have plenty of research in institutes and centers of excellence in various areas related to health and medicine and others. Um, within the School of Medicine, we are housed in the Department of Population and Public Health Sciences, formerly known as Department of Preventive Medicine. We just had a name change uh, a few months ago. And within our department, we have um, six different divisions focused spanning the key areas of public health, including disease prevention and global health, bioinformatics, biostatistics, epidemiology, environmental health, health behavior research. And we have over 100 faculty uh, who work in this department um, involved in teaching and doing research in key areas of public health. A little bit about the program itself. Um, as you may have heard, we offer six different concentrations to specialize in. So we have a core curriculum that students complete um, in public health, kind of the basics of public health before they go on to their specialized areas, um, which would be the concentrations. And in those, we have biostatistics and epidemiology, community health promotion, geohealth, which is a unique um, concentration in collaboration with the Spatial Sciences Institute at, UC at USC. And we also have a concentration in global health, uh, health services and policy, and generalist concentration. Uh, the generalist one is more aimed for folks who already have advanced degrees and want to kind of pick and choose their route in public health, um, while the rest of them are really giving you foundations in specific areas of public health. In addition to the core curriculum as well as the concentration courses, students also complete a practicum in the program. And the practicum is essentially like an internship um, where students would get hands-on experience in public health at an agency of their choosing that's you know, doing something in public health. Um, and we've had students kind of go all over the world or stay in their hometown or even stay at their place of work if they're doing work related to public health, as long as they're working on a new project or something they don't do in their nine to five. Um, it's really an opportunity for students to get, get more experience in this area as well as network with folks working in the field and hopefully um, take some steps towards future uh, career after graduation. 
Um, so students have done their practicum in places like, you know, a small NGO in a rural village in Tanzania, all the way to the World Health Organization, working on key policies um, with LA County. We have several students who go to LA County Department of Public Health in various counties in the, in the cities where they may live. Um, also working with uh, with corporate um, partners who may be working in public health. So there's a lot of different opportunities. I think, as you guys all know, public health has really come to the forefront in the past uh, past 18, 19 months or so with everything that's happening with the pandemic. And so there's plenty of opportunities, plenty of demand for students and trainees in this area. Um, I, I will leave it at that in terms of the program. Uh, you're welcome to, to learn more from our admissions advisor. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to one of our wonderful online MPH students, Sri Ramya Vimalakanda. Uh, Sri is currently enrolled as an online MPH student taking the generalist concentration at USC. And she is the director of online student relations within our USC Master of Public Health Student Association. She attended BLD University for her Bachelor's of Medicine and Bachelor's of Surgery, where she graduated from the BM, excuse me, Patil Medical College in India and with clinical experience. And she can share a little bit more about herself and her experience in the program before we will turn it over to the faculty. Thank you, Dr. Shubakumar. Uh, hello, professors, colleagues, and fellow classmates. It gives me great pleasure to host this Hot Topics Public Health Webinar sponsored by USC Online MBH program and your Master of Public Health Student Association. A little bit about myself, I'm in my second year of the Online MBH program at USC with a generalist concentration. I earned my MBBS degree from India and I'm a foreign medical graduate. I currently serve as the Director of Online Student Relations for the Master of Public Health Student Association. Professionally, I work as a clinical research coordinator at Rush University Medical Center, Chicago working with leading researchers on women's health topics. My goal has always been to improve health services for women and underserved populations in my community meaningfully to the field uh, of public health. I also volunteer from time to time at Ludi's Children's Hospital in Chicago. I aspire to implement the skills and knowledge gained through the program to serve the U.S. community in a long-lasting, impactful way. So I have the honor of introducing two rock stars of environmental health, Professor Tracy Bastien and Professor Rima Habri. I'm currently taking their classes. Professor Bastien is teaching MPH students on various environmental health topics, having done her undergraduate at Princeton and MPH at Johns Hopkins, and finishing her doctoral and postdoctoral studies at our very own USC. She joined USC as a professor, as well as the project administrator of the Children's Environmental Health Center and Southern California Environmental Health Sciences Center. She has about 35 research publications, multiple citations, and is currently involved in a large scale population studies in children and adolescents, a more than 20 year SoCal Children's Health Study, as well as a new cohort of uh, pregnant women and infants in the Madre Center for Environmental Health Disparities. Her research interests include understanding the role of environmental exposures in early life and during critical periods of development on lung growth, neurological development, asthma, obesity, and metabolic outcomes and childhood growth trajectories. Professor Rima Habre is also an associate professor at Environmental Health and Spatial Sciences Department. She graduated from the American University of Beirut with a bachelor's in environmental health and completed a master's in environmental health and received doctor of science in environmental health with a concentration in exposure science from Howard T. Chan School of Public Health. She has 106 publications multiple citations, and currently working on research on air pollution mixtures and social stresses on the health of vulnerable populations across the life course. She is also the NIH, NIEHS Young Investigator Award winner in 2017 and Penrose Award Best Combination of the Qualities of Scholarship, Character, and Leadership winner. 
Without further ado, I'd like to introduce professors Tracy Bastian and Rima Habbe and kick off the webinar on environmental health disparities and madres. Well, thank you so much, Sri, and the rest of the program for that nice introduction. Uh, we are very excited today to show some of our work in our Madre Center of Excellence in Environmental Health Disparities Research. Today, Dr. Haber and I will cover several topics. After attending today's webinar, you should have an understanding of some fundamental concepts related to environmental health disparities research. In addition, we will tell you about the Madre's pregnancy cohort and ongoing research in our center. You will have a deeper understanding of how the co-occurrence of environmental exposures and social stressors can affect health risks. Finally, we hope you will develop an awareness of cross-cutting dimensions of health disparities with a lens for the COVID-19 pandemic. Environmental health disparities exist when communities are exposed to a combination of environmental factors, such as poor air or water quality, and social inequities, such as lower access to health care, lower socioeconomic positions, and cultural influences. These disparities are often referred to as a double jeopardy of being disproportionately exposed to environmental exposures and having increased vulnerability to their effects. These disparities often occur along racial and ethnic lines due to decades of structural racism and discrimination, as well as unjust zoning for housing and discriminatory environmental policies. The field of environmental justice seeks to combat these disparities by advocating for the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, nationality, or income. When we were beginning this work, we noticed that in Los Angeles, the burden of environmental exposures and childhood obesity were not evenly distributed across all demographic groups. The figure here on the left shows prevalence rates of childhood obesity at age four from the first decade of the 2000s in LA County. The figure shows that the prevalence of early childhood obesity was highest in Latinx populations and continued to increase in Los Angeles whereas Black, White, and Asian populations did not see this alarming increasing trend. The figure on the right comes from data from the Office of Environmental Health Hazards Assessment in California. This figure shows that one in three Hispanic or Latinx persons live in one of the 20% most environmentally and economically disadvantaged census tracts in California, compared to at the bottom only one in 14 white individuals. The Modern Center for Environmental Health Disparities was founded in 2015 and focuses on how environmental exposures, population level vulnerabilities, and individual level stressors interact to affect maternal and child health outcomes like childhood obesity. The Madre Center established the Madre's Pregnancy Cohort a cohort of approximately 900 mother and child pairs from health disparity populations in Los Angeles who predominantly live in environmentally burdened communities. Research projects focused on both mother and child are nested within the cohort and are supported by an administrative structure and supporting cores. The center also supports a strong community engagement program focused on increasing environmental health literacy among community residents an innovative internship program for first-generation undergraduate students, and a pilot projects program for underrepresented early-stage investigators are both central to the center's mission. Training the next generation and in increasing diversity in the scientific workforce is a key component of our center. The center's internship program for undergraduates from underrepresented groups provides opportunities for students to join Madre's research and community engagement team. Thus far, 18 first-generation college student interns have been trained in the joint program and have gone on to graduate school or employment in public health fields 
including even joining our own staff team after graduation. Working with diverse communities requires strong community-based and clinical partnerships, as well as a participant-centered approach. Our staff are hired from participants' communities, which ensures that the staff are able to establish trust and strong relationships based on shared culture and language. A fundamental aspect of our research and community engagement efforts is that our research is conducted with diverse populations and not on diverse populations. The needs of communities and participants come first in our work. The Community Engagement Program has centered its efforts on building community environmental health literacy by conducting workshops with community residents and developing infographics like the ones you see here on this slide. These pictures highlight a workshop training on how to use low-cost air monitors to understand air quality in community residents' neighborhoods. Another workshop, originally developed by one of the undergraduate interns, focuses on teaching residents how to make and use less toxic cleaning products in their homes. Hundreds of community residents have participated in these, in these workshops. In the first five years of our center's work, we focused on understanding the role of environmental exposures and stress during pregnancy and maternal and child health outcomes related to obesity and weight gain and weight retention through the first year after birth. We have expanded the study now, and we are following both mothers and children through five years after birth, and we are investigating the role of these exposures on a variety of health outcomes in both mother and child. You may wonder why we focus on pregnancy. Well, based on the developmental origins of health and disease, or DOHAD hypothesis, the period of fetal development is a vulnerable window of exposure for childhood health outcomes. Also, because pregnancy is a period of dynamic biological and hormonal fluctuations that are designed to support fetal development, we hypothesize that the prenatal period may also increase maternal susceptibility to these toxic exposures. The overarching goal of the Madre study is to understand the effects of prenatal environmental factors and social stressors on maternal and child health outcomes among low-income, predominantly Hispanic families in urban Los Angeles who experience high burden of exposure as well as adverse health outcomes. The Madre study is a prospective pregnancy cohort study, which means that enrollment starts in pregnancy and we follow mothers and babies to measure exposures and health outcomes. We partnered with community health centers dedicated to medically underserved populations in order to recruit study participants. Our inclusion criteria were quite broad. Women needed to be less than 30 weeks gestation at the time of enrollment, over 18 years old, HIV negative, they had to be able to consent, not are incarcerated, and they needed to be only carrying one baby. This is our Candyland style map which is really just meant to give you an idea of all of the touch points we have with our participants, starting in the pregnancy period, shown here in pink, through the first year of life in blue, and finally from years two to five in green. About 75% of our study participants are Hispanic or Latinx. About 10% are non-Hispanic Black. 8% are non-Hispanic white, with a handful of other groups represented in our cohort. Our families come from very low-income households, with over 40% having an annual household income of less than $30,000 per year, and many of our mothers are not aware of their family income levels. Over 50% of our study participants have at most a 12th grade education, and about 50% were employed during the pregnancy when they enrolled. Similar to our original motivation for the center, our current center research projects focus on the prenatal period as a period of vulnerability for environmental and social stress exposures on longer term mental health, I'm sorry, maternal health outcomes like depression and cardiovascular disease. 
We are also investigating the effects of these exposures on biological pathways like inflammation, neuroendocrine function, lipid homeostasis, coagulation and endothelial dysfunction in an aggregated measure called allostatic load, as well as how some of these pathways might mediate the effects of the environmental exposures on the health outcomes. I'm now going to pass the presentation to Dr. Hover. Thank you so much, Dr. Bastain, and thank you, Shri, for that lovely introduction, and to you all for attending, and to the organizers for inviting us to talk to you about MADRES and our work on environmental health disparities research. And so I'm going to show you just a few sort of maps and visuals about our data and our cohort, um, and to try to shed light on some kind of initiatives that we put together when COVID hit. Because as you all might be aware or might you know be thinking, that environmental health disparities and health inequities overall you know, do kind of affect marginalized populations in a lot of different ways and not just in terms of environmental exposures. And so this slide here you see in the map shows you the neighborhoods on the map. So these are colored from, you know, very dark pink to red to lighter colors. This is in LA, urban Los Angeles in California. And those darkest neighborhoods that you see are the ones where we have the highest recruitment of these pregnant women from. And so we partner with four different clinics, and that has changed a little bit over time. Um, but by doing that, we are basically recruiting the population generally that lives within you know, urban Los Angeles. So you see East LA, downtown, central, south central LA are some of the highest sort of recruitment neighborhoods in Madres. And these are, like Dr. Bastain described, predominantly Hispanic and lower income women, but not exclusively, of course. And so there's a link down here that you can see to an, um, what we call a story map that we put together, describing a little bit more about the data and the neighborhoods that our Madres participants come from. Please feel free to explore that, but just to tell you a little bit more about these neighborhoods. So if you start on the left, looking at the map on the left, this shows you the racial ethnic distribution in LA. And so there are these very dark pink boundaries that are drawing basically lines around the Madres neighborhoods where we have at least five participants. And the colors underneath show you the predominant category, meaning, you know, what racial ethnic group is predominant in that neighborhood. And the green shows that most of these Madrid neighborhoods are Hispanic or Latino neighborhoods, and the yellow is mostly African American or black communities. So as you can see, you know, Madrid neighborhoods are very much Hispanic, Latino, and African American. The map on the right overlays what is known as the sort of the 1939 redlining zones or the discriminatory housing policies that were in place back in the 30s and 40s that basically outlined neighborhoods that were deemed sort of high risk or you know not recommended to invest in where people who were actually mostly African American and Hispanic and disadvantaged communities were not given equal or fair treatment in terms of being able to buy land, you know, to start businesses. Um, a lot of toxic land uses perhaps were placed there. And so as you can see in the map, our Madres neighborhoods also overlap with a lot of those very dark reds or yellow zones that were the most basically redlined or high, labeled high risk with discriminatory practices back then. And the issue is that even though this wasn't actually too long ago, but the effects of those discriminatory policies has gone, you know, has, has remained over time and has led to us seeing these very strong spatial patterns in what we're calling this double jeopardy that Dr. Bastain explained before. So in the map that you see here, it has some census data. So the top panel is mainly demographic characteristics, 
And the bottom panel is some of the social risk factors you know, that we think about, such as poverty and high rent burden, maybe poor college graduation rates. And you see that the patterns in these maps do not seem random. They're very kind of spatially drawn. And a lot of the demographic characteristics seem to kind of mimic or imitate those social stressors or risk factors. And so that goes to tell you how these sort of, you know, systemic and persistent discriminatory practices have led to very strongly entrenched spatial patterns in these risk factors, not just from environmental exposures, but also from social stressors. And we call these place-based or neighborhood level generally. And these are some of the things that you might be, let's say, involved with if you were to pursue a geohealth track. Um, but it basically paints the picture of this very uneven burden of environmental exposures and susceptibility in low-income, marginalized, uh, you know, groups and populations. And so this is what we're trying to study in Madres. And just to paint that picture a little bit clearer, so the map you see here, the colors correspond to what is called the cumulative impact score from a tool that Dr. Bastin introduced before called the Cal Screen. So Cal Screen was put together by the OEHA, or Office of Environmental Health, Health Hazards Assessment, I believe, from the California EPA. And it's a screening tool. It's meant to sort of shed light on environmental justice issues in the state of California and provide some ranking or scoring of a variety of environmental risk factors, but also social risk factors. And so the overall score goes from 0 to 100. And again, in the map, you see that the Madres neighborhoods you know, fall in those darkest pink to red colors, the highest percentiles of this cumulative impact score, meaning the most environmentally burdened, but also the most vulnerable in terms of population susceptibility criteria. And the plots on the right show you the distribution of that data in the Madres neighborhoods. So, you know, again, you see a very high pollution burden score, uh, even higher population susceptibility or characteristics score, and then the cumulative impact score kind of takes both of these things together into consideration. And so in a lot of our studies, we're actually assigning this data to where our participants live, and we look at these measures as predictors of some of the adverse health outcomes that we're all interested in. Another key part of this, you know, when we think about place-based exposures and neighborhood level factors, is that where we live matters. And if you think of that at a, at a very basic level, at a very sort of intuitive level, you could probably relate to that idea, right? And so where you live, you know, not only dictates maybe the environmental exposures that you're getting, it also dictates how habitable your neighborhood might be, how safe, how walkable, how easy it is for you to get, let's say, access to healthy food options, um, to different types of services. And so what we do in Madres is for all our participants, we build these very highly resolved daily residential timelines. And so that's the plot you see on the left here. And the x-axis is just calendar time from when we started the study, and the y-axis is all the different participants. And I think we're up to like 800 or 900 right now. And so the highlighted blue dots are the dates of birth or when all these babies were born. And you can see this sort of very beautiful kind of progression over time with enrollment that is really a massive effort that Dr. Bastain leads to get the cohorts together, right? But we take all these birth dates and we go back in time to cover the pregnancy period. That's a somewhat dark red or orange you see in this plot. We go even earlier than that into the preconception period. And then, of course, we keep building these forward in time, you know, to follow up these babies and their moms to the latest time point that we have. The reason we do this is for every day of every child's life, 
we want to know where they have lived. So we take that address location and we geocode it, we put it on a map, and that allows us to basically link up a lot of different data sets that help us characterize these neighborhoods that they live in. So we can learn a lot more about, let's say, environmental exposures, mainly air pollution that we do a lot of work on, but also a lot of these neighborhood level stressors. The other big advantage of doing this work is that it helps us overcome some of the strong limitations that usually you know, can be found in epidemiological studies. So the plot on the right tells you a little bit more about that. So in reality, you know, people move. Um, you know, people don't stay at the same residence all the time. And so what we've done with these timelines is that we can also capture all residential mobility. And so you see the x-axis, it's basically weeks relative to the birth date of the baby. And there's a vertical purple line that's the time at birth. And then the red color shows you the number of moves that are happening in the Madre's data in the pregnancy period and then right after delivery, you know, as the baby grows. And so what that tells you, and maybe something we didn't appreciate before, is that there's actually a lot of moving happening Maybe that's intuitive because, you know, when you have a pregnancy and a baby, the family is growing, but also maybe certain people at are, are at higher risk of moving to, let's say, more risky neighborhoods, they can't afford it, or if there are other issues, you know, that are compounding this. So just to bring it all together, the reason we do this is so we can understand what people are exposed to at a very high resolution over time and to also account for any movement that is happening in space so that we really understand, you know, the influence of where we live on health. So this plot, it's a little bit busy, and it's work that I did with my wonderful postdoc, Miriam Gerges, who is now um, in a different job leading research and so the map you see here is based on some early work in probably half of the cohorts back then. It shows you different residential locations of our participants, and they're colored by different clusters. So clusters are basically groups that we have determined are very similar to each other and basically very different from each other. So for example, the points in blue that you see there are a cluster A here that we call near toxics. What we've done is we've generated, you know, in GIS and using these geohealth types of methods, we've generated data on about 94 different characteristics of these neighborhoods, all the way from chemical pollution to the built environment to social factors, um, demographic factors, and so on. And so what we see, for example, are some multivariate patterns in these profiles. And so we were able to tell from the data that there were, let's say, at least four different clusters in these neighborhoods. And this is a small region, mind you, relative to, you know, the, the U.S. This is all within L.A., but we still saw that the orange dots, for example, were very different from the green dots, from the blue dots, from the purple dots. And the way we could do this is because we assigned all this different data and did some multivariate analysis. But basically what we learned was that the blue dots were disadvantaged neighborhoods that had a lot of industrial pollution and were very close to what we call toxics or hazards. Whereas the green dots were also disadvantaged neighborhoods, also had high unemployment rates and poverty, but they were more exposed to traffic pollution and they happened to be food deserts. So the blue dots actually had more kind of food assistance facilities. So even though those two, for example, clusters were right next to each other, the experiences of the women living within them are very different in terms of what affects their health. 
And similarly, we saw a different pattern for those orange and purple dots. And we're doing this again to understand sort of that cumulative burden of a lot of these different characteristics on health because we're thinking about health disparities specifically. Okay, so talking about health disparities, you know, when the pandemic hit, of course, everyone was affected, but then we were quickly starting to realize and see, perhaps not surprisingly, that our same communities that we worry about in terms of health inequities were also facing the biggest burden or threat from COVID-19 in terms of, you know, case rates and mortality and not having access the same level of testing or vaccination, but also not having the same luxuries, let's say, that other communities might have in terms of being able to work from home or stay safe, etc. This story was actually uh, featuring work done in Oregon Public Health Department, which one of your own students or your own colleagues in this program you know, actually graduated from the MPH was that was leading the efforts in terms of responding to COVID-19. So I'm very proud to show you this because, you know, it features one of our very own and it shows you how incredibly important the work you can do following an MPH is. And so when COVID hit, we basically started to think about, well, how can we communicate or disseminate more information that would help our participants, you know, deal with COVID, um, know what to do, find the information they need. And this was really, you know, the impetus of the group to try to put together this story map. And so story maps are basically kind of like web pages that include a lot of geographic information or maps, um, kind of like a blog page, I would say. And so the link is here and you're welcome to visit it, you know, anytime and look at the data. But we as a group decided to kind of think together about what information do we need to disseminate. And so we did, you know, we incorporated a lot of these geospatial data sets, but we also added in information on where to find, you know, vaccine sites, where to find testing sites. And we were reporting some of the COVID data itself. And so, you know, sadly, but that's the reality of health disparities is these maps are actually from the story map that we put together, but way back in time during the peak of the pandemic, I would say like, you know, maybe three to four months in. And so again, you see these pink boundaries of where our Madre's neighborhoods are, and they would fall or coincide with where the highest case counts for COVID-19 were occurring and also the highest case rates. So I invite you to look at the story map to kind of see you know, the remaining pieces of information that we provided in there. But also Dr. Bastain and colleagues in Madres led efforts to develop the survey to basically check in with our participants and see what they're experiencing. And not surprisingly, we saw that about three quarters of participants reported at least one income in their household was reduced either by losing a job or having hours reduced. And this is data from back then, um, you know, it might not reflect current times, but it's important because it was during the pandemic or the early days of the pandemic. Also about half of our participants reported that either their job or their partners put them at higher risk of COVID-19, so they couldn't get the same protections, let's say, that anyone else might. They reported feelings of discrimination and social isolation on the rise, and most of them reported getting less physical exercise and eating more often to cope with stress. So of course, these are all you know, very influential in terms of the stressors and the mental health and the metabolic health impacts that we are worried about in Madres. And so Dr. Jill Johnston leads our community engagement core and her team puts together these amazing infographics and sources of information, both in English and in Spanish. And here we're just showing you some of them, but I'm sure if you go on the Madri's website or our website, you can see more. But she basically took it upon herself and her team to translate a lot of the key information that people need 
in terms of what to do if someone in your home, you know, got COVID, how to take care of them and stay safe and keep your family safe, how to clean and disinfect your home during COVID, uh, and basically, you know, how to keep your home and family safe. And of course, people don't always have the luxury, you know, to move to a different place or even different rooms within the same house. So this was very key and timely information. I'm going to spend the next few minutes showing you a different variety or flavor of work that we do in Madrid as well, which is getting more at the personal level. So all the methods you know, and analyses we've showed you so far are what we call at the population level. You know, they're looking at neighborhoods. The neighborhoods are very reflective of what people experience, but we can get way more personal to really understand what people are exposed to in their personal breathing space, let's say, when it comes to air pollution. These are will just be very quick visuals to give you an idea, but basically in some of our Sub studies that are a bit more intensive in terms of the data collection, we use a variety of different air pollution monitors to do what we call personal exposure monitoring, and this is really my area of expertise and my field. And so, for example, the device you see on the top, it's called a MicroPEM, and we use that to measure minute level PM2.5 concentrations or air pollution concentrations in the breathing zone of our participants. And we do that over a four day period of time, repeatedly over the pregnancy. But also in the plots you see on the right, we use a different setup to collect particles on filters that the woman, you know, also in the breathing zone of the pregnant woman. So she wears these devices in a purse that you can see here on the plot in the picture and it's collecting these air samples from right around the shoulder area to collect these particles on filters that we can then analyze for chemistry and try to understand what are those sources of pollution that these women are breathing. And so we pair all these um, designs with very detailed GPS data, either by apps that we've developed or that we use that are commercially available but basically what we do with some of our students in spatial sciences, and this again gives you a bit of a flavor of geohealth, is that we use these very high resolution GPS tracks to try to understand environmental exposures within actual activity spaces. So meaning instead of, so, so the plot on the left here you see is work by Lee, which is a nice paper he published reviewing these methods if you're interested. And the work on the right is by Yan Shu, who's my PhD student in spatial sciences. So there we're showing that instead of using, let's say, you know, the typical residential neighborhood approach where you might see where someone lives and draw a circle around that, we can actually use the GPS track itself to follow people along in terms of where they've been and understand exposures within those spaces. And we can also give a lot more weight, that's the kernel density plot you see at the bottom there, to the places where they spent the most time in. So we do all this to minimize error in our assessments and to really understand what people are exposed to. There are so many more analyses that I can show you from this data, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep it very brief and also show you that with this very dense GPS data, so the plot you see on the left, this is from a lot of different people. Of course, we can't show you anything more sensitive than that. Um, but if you think of that bottom piece of that cube, the flat part on the bottom as the map with latitude and longitude, once you start sort of looking at the frequency of certain locations appearing in the data, then you start understanding that these are places where people spend a lot more time in, usually homes or work locations or you know parents and family. And then we can start to connect these stay locations with the trips that happen between them, you know, as people move around. So what we're really doing is we're trying to understand mobility patterns and relate that to personal exposure to air pollution. And so just from analyzing this data in one of our sub-studies, the plot you see on the right here, 
you know, shows us basically the context, the type of place that these stays are occurring. So the vertical axis is the origin of any given trip, and the horizontal axis or the x-axis is the destination. And pedestrian trips are in blue, and vehicular trips are in red. So overall, we see in this population of pregnant women in Madres that there's about three times more vehicular trips than pedestrian trips overall, and that most of these pedestrian trips, the walking, is happening within commercial and services locations or between them, and very little pedestrian trips or walking is happening at parks and open spaces. And that's potentially a problem for LA and something that we can, you know, intervene on or share with the city officials to shed light on the need for nicer, bigger, better, safer, cleaner parks and open spaces. That's what you see at the very uh, bottom right-hand corner. Okay, so with that, I hope we've given you a nice overview of some of the work that's happening in Madres and some of the issues that we think about when it comes to health disparities, especially environmental health disparities. Obviously, the center is very big and um, this plot shows you all the different project leads involved. So Dr. Bastain is the director of the center with Dr. Carrie Breton. Dr. Shuei Farzan leads project two. I lead project three and what we call the exposure assessment core. Dr. Jill Johnston leads the community engagement core. Dr. Claudia Toledo Corral uh, leads the investigator development core. And we're all, you know, we all have different expertise in different areas, obviously, but we're also a very uh, great team, and we are leading a lot of different sub-studies and kind of research questions within Madre. So I'm sure everyone is always happy to talk to you, depending on your interests. Please feel free to reach out. So with that, I believe I'm turning it over to Phil. Thank you all for your attention, and we're happy to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you to all our presenters, Shuba, Shri, Rima, and Tracy, for sharing all that just wonderful information on the program and your experiences. Next, I really wanted to just take some time to go over any questions that anyone might have. Uh, we did receive a few already. So if you have any questions, um, take advantage of this opportunity. Please be sure to share them in, your Q in our Q&A box. Uh, so I can make sure that we are able to address those and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we did have one question um, already come up and and I, I would, the question could be for anyone, maybe um, Shuba or um, Sri, but it says, what research opportunities are available for online students? Sure, I'm happy to take a stab at it and then Tree and, and um, uh, faculty, please respond if you'd like to. But yeah, generally speaking, we have a lot of research opportunities because our department faculty are doing a lot of excellent research. And so there's opportunities for students to get involved, uh, whether those students are on campus or online. Um, we send out postings pretty much all the time about this research opportunity or that one uh, through our you know, the, our learning management system. So you'll probably get on a daily basis uh, advertisements for opportunities to do research with the faculty, whether it's for your practicum or whether it's just, a, you know, a side uh, job that you may do or a volunteer activity, but there's plenty of opportunity. Um, Shri, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So like Dr. Shubhakumar said, uh, there are opportunities that are being posted. But as like working professionals in the online program, uh, there would be voluntary opportunities or practicum opportunities in whichever there are usually postings in uh, multiple um, multiple concentrations. I've seen a few in health promotion, in like literacy, and also uh, community health promotion and uh, biostatistics. So they, those are all great opportunities in terms and uh, this. This also made me aware regarding opportunities in environmental health. So, yeah. I 
can maybe just add to uh, what Dr. Kumar and Shri just said. Uh, I currently have two online MPH students who are working with me on one on a research project and one on their practicum um, to actually do some translation of uh, materials, or I should say engagement and translation, not, not Spanish translation, um, back to the study participants. So I think there are a lot of faculty um, in our department who um, now participate and work with students directly in their, uh, in their practicum and or uh, capstone projects. So I think it depends on you know, interests of the students and interests of the faculty and availability of projects, but there are lots of opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, again, it could be open for uh, maybe the, the one of the professors. Are there any interventions or health programs that the Madre study participants are offered, i.e. WIC, or would that intervene with analysis? Thank you. So I think that's a really excellent question. Um, this is an epidemiologic study, so we are predominantly um, focused on observing what's happening in the environment uh, that our participants live and work and studying sort of the outcomes. Um, that being said, we work really closely with our clinical partners, and so we have a pretty good idea of when some of the women in our studies are experiencing challenges or need uh, help connecting to either healthcare services or, um, as you mentioned, things like WIC and other uh, social services. So I, we really have that partnership uh, between uh, our study and the, the clinical community as well as some other referrals. Uh, and that's how we conduct the study, as opposed to us doing the interventions ourselves. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have another question. It, it looks like it's directed uh, for Shri. Um, it seems that you've taken advantage, obviously, of the opportunities USC provides to their students, the networking, the resources. You're part of MAPSA. So a common question students ask, um, uh, recruitment is, do online students have the same access to campus resources as um, as on on-campus students do? Yeah, I feel uh, we have access to the same resources. So we have access to library resources, uh, including material from Norris Medical Library. We have access to professors, teaching assistants, and academic advisors. Uh, we also have access to career resources and the meetings with uh, career counseling and uh, for resume building and other career opportunities. So uh, I feel we have like equal access to uh, same as uh, on-campus students. For, uh, we are trying to, uh, from the student government uh, way, we are trying to promote more social events also, um, but yeah, as working professionals, uh, I think those would be the only thing that's uh, not as much as on-campus students. Thank you, Shri. Uh, we do have another um, question. It's uh, Well, first, a comment. This is such important work. Uh, what is your hope for the impact of the research that you do? I feel like this is a Dr. Bastain question, <laughs> but but I'm happy to start. Or do you want to go ahead first? Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Haber. I feel like I've dominated the answering, so why don't you take a step first and then I can. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think really our hope is that the research would be impactful in terms of providing actionable data to you know officials, the planners, the health organizations to really make a difference in you know, answering some of these health questions for the outcomes that these women experience. So we have lots of different ways that that could happen, but just one example, for, for example, is that a lot of our clinic partners you know, are worried about losing some of these women or some of their own population in terms of follow-up after delivery in the postpartum period that we know is a very 
kind of sensitive time as a, and a very risky time for the mom after she delivers. And so they're learning from working with us some of these factors, you know, that might contribute to losing people to follow up or what kinds of services they need or, you know, are there periods of time where they might need more contact and information and support, uh, especially as a woman goes through pregnancy in the postpartum period. I feel like there are so many other ways that, you know, we hope and work on our research being impactful. And of course, Dr. Johnson needs a lot of that kind of translational aspect with the community engagement work. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Bastin, you might want to add to this as well. Sure. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Hubbard definitely touched on some of the key pieces. Um, we really consider this study to be solution oriented. Um, it is observational in nature as opposed to an intervention like we talked about a few minutes ago, but it has a lot of implications for helping um, improve the situation for marginalized communities, both at a very high sort of global um, policy level um, a lot of research coming out of our group and others at USC have led directly to policy change um, in terms of you know, lowering pollution exposures, um, both in the air and the water, um, as well as in household products. That's another area of interest of ours. Uh, and, and sort of at that policy level, the, the participants um, contribute their experiences and their data, which will then eventually translate into helping you know, the communities at large, much larger than just the participants. But we also feel like impacting our own communities and you know, very close um, with our participant com community is equally important. So we really work to educate our participants on some of the exposures in their lives. Um, I mentioned before that we have a student working with us on report back um, or sort of participant translation of the research. And part of the um, uh, component of this initiative is to actually provide detailed information that's useful to participants about their own data, their own exposures to environmental toxicants and what they can do about it. So I think that's sort of all the way from the participant level to the society level. Uh, is what our the, the ultimate goal of our work is. Perfect. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, it looks like we're almost out of time. So if we didn't get to your specific question, we'll be uh, sure to reach out to you on a one-on-one -on -one situation. Uh, we'll be sure to answer any questions that you might have. So at, at this time, I really would just like to thank all the presenters, thank you, Shuva, thank you, Shri, Tracy, and Rima for sharing all this great information and your experiences. It really does mean a lot to us. Lastly, we'd like to thank you all again for taking time out of your day to hear more about USC and our hot topics in public health. As a reminder for next steps, here is my contact information with my email address included. If you have any other questions or if there were any that we did not get to today, we'll be sure to send you a quick follow-up email to get these answered, answered. Thank you all so much. And again, just a reminder, a copy of this recording and slide presentation will be available in the next following days. Again, thank you for joining us. We hope everyone has a good week. Be safe and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.